On D-Day, Allied deception fooled Hitler and German command so bad that they had their troops in all the wrong places. But if you think that German command's doubts ended with the actual invasion, you are mistaken. The doubts will go on and one man will be at the heart of it. And this is Agent Garbo. I'm Astrid Deinhardt and this is a Spies and Ties special from our D-Day 24 Hours series. As I said in my coverage of the Double Cross system, link is in the description, I'm presenting four of the most spectacular double agents of the British counterintelligence effort who had significant impact on D-Day and Operation Overlord. Today's agent will have the claim to fame to be one of the only two operatives in this war to be decorated for his service. The same service by both sides. The other is Agent Zigzag, or Eddie Chapman, who I covered a few weeks ago. In any case, Garbo will be awarded the Iron Cross by Hitler and King George will make him a member of the Order of the British Empire. In both cases, for his extraordinary service during the Normandy campaign. And here is his story. He is Juan Pujol Garcia. Uh, here he is. He is from Spain, but lives in quiet suburban London with his wife and son. His neighbors think nothing of the polite little Spaniard who catches the tube into town every day to work at the BBC. Little do they know that Senor Pujol is hard at work to secure the success of D-Day and the freedom of Europe. Pujol hates fascism after his experience during the Spanish Civil War. When the World War begins, he thinks to himself, I must do something, something practical. I must make my contribution towards the good of humanity. He wants to spy for the British, but the Brits turn him down. Two more tries with the same result lead to another idea. Why not simply start working for the Germans? Gain their trust, learn their secrets, and then hand it all over to the British. So, Pujol contacts the Germans. He will later write, I began to use my gift of gab and rented away as befitted a stouch Nazi and Francoist. The Abwehr chief in Madrid, Karl Erich Kühnthal, is convinced. In July 1941, Pujol is sent to Lisbon to make his merry way to Britain to train and recruit a network of spies. In Lisbon, he tries the British again and again has no success. But if the Germans want him to spy, he'll spy for them. Maybe he can cause some chaos. He stays in Portugal pretending he is in Britain. Think of that. He uses guidebooks dictionaries, newspapers, magazine articles to simply make stuff up. Reports that are also full of errors, really obvious ones. Pujol can't get to grip with the imperial measurements of inches, feet and miles of British currency with its 12 pence in a shilling and 20 shillings in a pound. In one report, he tells his handlers that there are men in Glasgow who will do anything for a liter of wine while Scots drink in pints. And it is seldom wine, right? Fortunately, Kulatan is as ignorant of British measurements and money as he is of Scottish drinking habits. Over the next nine months, he heaps praise on the new star spite code name agent Arabel. So, the British code breakers at Bletchley Park are reading the back and forth between Pujol and the up there as well. MI5's people are baffled 
by all the weirdness in the reports. This spy is either a moron or a fantasist, but the Germans are eating it all up. Then, in February 1942, Araceli, Pujol's wife, has had enough of the British denials. She explains the situation to an American naval attaché in Portugal, who tells MI6. After a typical British inter-service battle, Tar Robertson and MI5 emerge victorious, and Agent Arabel is finally a double agent. They christen him Garbo, hmm? after Greta Garbo, because he's the best actor in the world. Over the next two years, Garbo and his handler Tommy Harris invent an intricate web of fictional sub-agents scattered across Britain at all levels of society. Okay, to name just a few. There is, for example, a Venezuelan in Glasgow, a violent anti-Soviet South African and a Welsh nationalist who supposedly leads some sort of Aryan Brotherhood. Over the course of the war, they sent over 300 letters written in secret ink and over 1,200 wireless transmissions. Garbo crowns his credibility with the Germans when he sends an accurate warning of Operation Torch in November 42. MI5 ensures that it arrives too late to be used, but the Abwehr loves him for it. Clever, right? By the end of 43, messages from Garbo have top priority for forwarding to Berlin. Then, in February 44, Garbo's fictional den of spies goes to work on Operation Fortitude. His men in Scotland support Fortitude North by reporting that elements of the fictional British Fourth Army are getting ready to invade Norway. They report troop sightings in Dundee and major naval exercises on the Clyde. In the south, his Welsh nationalists report that the fake 1st United States Army Group is assembling near Dover to invade Calais. All of which is supported by the physical deception and other double-cross agents. Finally, in the early hours of June 6, so today, comes Garbo's most important contribution. You see, he will be crucial in the days and weeks after today, after D-Day. It will be Garbo's job to keep up the ruse that today is a decoy and real threat is still aimed at the Pas de Calais. The Allies hope that this will keep the Germans from reinforcing Normandy. At three o'clock this morning, Garbo warned his German handlers that the invasion fleet was sailing. Again, too late for the Germans to do anything. And the German radio operator is not at his post anyway. True to his cunning and ability to improvise, Garbo turns this to his advantage. The radio operator comes on air at 8 a.m. and receives the message. By then, of course, it's obvious that Garbo was telling the truth. And now he twists the knife. He scolds his handlers. This makes me question your seriousness and your sense of responsibility. I cannot accept excuses or negligence. Were it not for my ideals and my faith, I would abandon this work. Kulental's reply is to grovel for forgiveness, praise the Spaniard and his network, and beg him to continue spying. Garbo has the Nazis eating out of his palm of his hand. So much so that after the war, he will fear that any surviving Nazis, when they discover he has duped them so completely, will try to kill him. So he convinces MI5 to help him fake his own death and disappear. It will take almost four decades until his story becomes public. Then. Finally, Garbo will follow the man he helped today to the coast of Normandy. 
At the 40th anniversary of D-Day in 1984, he gets to see the sights of the battle that he worked so hard to cloak in confusion. To see all of our intelligence coverage, check out this playlist. And please, join the Time Ghost Army to become part of this great adventure to document World War II and other historical milestones. You can do that at timeghost.tv or patreon.com and I will see you next time, darlings. Thank you.